Finally tonight, another one of those what we might call drive-by stories. It's about a place we drove by any number of times and sometimes wondered, what's that about? So one day we stopped and asked. It turns out there is quite a story. It's a two-bedroom. They all have granite countertops, ceramic tile floors, the refrigerator, stove, microwave, dishwasher, all included. Regina Lavington's looking for an apartment, and Jim Dalton's got plenty to show her. Dalton has recently finished redeveloping the old Neighborhood Gardens apartment complex just north of the Edward Jones Dome. It's something of an important landmark with a special place in St. Louis history. It was 2002 when I drove by it, looked at it, and had some interest in it. And then... Uh, I mean, it was kind of a, a mess back then. It was then. a total mess. Uh, there was a lot of homeless people living here. It was very high crime. Um, I just looked at it, I seen a lot of potential, so... Did you know the history at all, or was I, it just I the structure to, itself? I went down to the history uh, museum on Skinker uh -huh. and started doing some searches on it and started reading about it, and then uh, got more and more interested and then started talking to people. This was St. Louis's first low-income housing project, just a few stories tall and built in the 1930s, not by the government, but by a private organization. The first federal housing projects in St. Louis were built on a similar low-rise plan about 10 years later. Carr Square for blacks, Clinton Peabody for whites. And then came the move to the high-rise federal projects of the 50s and 60s. St. Louis's pruitt Igo development was one of the country's most famous for its size and for its dramatic failure. Before all that, there was Neighborhood Gardens, which was open only to whites when it opened in 1935. It was built and operated by the Neighborhood Association, a Northside social service agency with its roots in the early days of social work and settlement houses. The association ran all kinds of neighborhood programs and still does. It exists today as the Youth and Family Center on North 20th Street. It got out of the low-income housing business long ago, but it still serves the neighborhood. The needs haven't changed much. The neighborhood has changed some, but the kids are still here, and they still need program, and we're still doing the same things we've always done. We still have a residential camp out in Cedar Hills, Missouri, and we have this location here where we do after school, and we do computer education now. So we don't do the old woodwork. You don't do woodwork, but you're showing you're teaching computers. Yes, so we are still doing that, and we have a lot of sports programs. Inside its headquarters, there is a plaque honoring J. A. Wolf, a driving force at this agency for many years, and the man who set out to provide a new kind of inner city housing. J. A. Um, uh, back in the uh, 30s uh, received a fellowship. He was interested in, in housing for the uh, area that was in dire need of good housing, and so he got a fellowship, went to Germany, spent oh, six or eight months in Germany studying their housing programs. Returned Ernest Dietrich worked for J.A. Wolf at the Neighborhood Association before Wolf retired uh, in the 1960s. Yeah, Dietrich's sister-in-law, Esther Kosny, grew up with the association's programs and later volunteered. They both knew Wolf as a powerful influence on the lives of Northsiders. He was my hero. He's the hero to most people of my age that live down there. You say Mr. Wolf, and they all just, whoa, they have a story about how wonderful he was to them. And he, he kept it up. Obviously, he was, he was, a, he was a true believer in, in what he was, was he doing, was. wasn't he? Definitely was. Wolf's idea for low-income housing was based on the Bauhaus styles he had seen in Germany, open, airy, and green, replacing crowded slums with an urban oasis that filled an entire city block. Everybody had a balcony. Right. Every, every unit had a balcony. Uh, so this was all just a landscape garden area. And this is a design, you know, from, in the federal projects that went away when they built the high-rise, but they, they came back to this Right, they're doing that right now. On. They're replacing yeah. the Cochrane with uh, low-rise buildings. So, right, right. Uh, this is, this and this something. was all supposed to be healthier for everybody. I mean, and I, I mentally think and socially healthier. And, you know, the people that we have coming in today, I mean, they just... Uh, they love everybody having a balcony. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not many places today that you get a balcony. Um, and the history, I mean, the, the, the brickwork, the design, it's, it's just yeah. a yeah. very nice uh, design. This was uh, a unique experience, experiment at the time. Mm -hmm. I, uh, 
and it seemed, seemed to work well for many, many years, and now they're going back to it. So yeah. it's. Dalton figures his tenants today won't be highly paid professionals, but will be more like the original tenants, working class folks who work in and around downtown. He even has the old records, including the name of a 1940s tenant, newspaper reporter and future playwright William Inge. But make no mistake, Jim Dalton is a businessman. J.A. Wolf was a social worker and an activist. The Neighborhood Association operated neighborhood gardens from the 1930s to the 1960s and then sold it to a private operator. It was shut down around 1990 and sat empty and deteriorating for 15 years. No, when I got a hold of it, you really uh, couldn't see your hand in front of your face. It was overgrown so bad. Uh, I mean, uh, trees, I don't know how many trees we took out, but it was just, it was just all overgrown, it looked like a, a jungle. This new version is in some ways improved, modernized, there are larger apartments, but where there was once gardens, there are now parking spaces. But Dalton has stayed with one of Mr. Wolf's ideas for improving city living. No basement apartments. That area will be used for storage, laundry, recreation, community space. This is a neighborhood that has seen a lot of changes, and it still is. There are plans to develop the nearby Bottle District. There's new housing, and some of the old housing projects are coming down. And one remnant of an earlier time, a radical idea in its day, has survived to once again have a chance to become part of St. Louis's future.